Well, good evening and welcome to Heritage Baptist Church. Good to see each one of you here this evening. Take your songbooks, if you will. Turn to number 305, number 305. Let's stand together as we sing. Praise him, praise him. 305. Praise him, praise him, Jesus, our blessed Redeemer. Sing, O oh, earth, his wonderful love proclaim. Hail him, hail him, highest archangels in glory. Strength and honor give to his holy name. Like a shepherd, Jesus will guard his children. In his arms, he carries them all day long. Praise him, praise him, tale of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. On that second. Praise him, praise him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. For our sins he suffered and bled and died. Gee, our rock, our hope of eternal salvation. Hail him, hail him, Jesus the crucified. Sound his praises, Jesus who bore our sorrows. Love unbounded, wonderful, deep and strong. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. As the instruments play, get around and welcome each other this evening. As you return to your seats, join me on that last stanza, page 305 on the last. Praise him, praise him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Heavenly portals, loud with hosannas ring. Jesus, Savior, reigneth forever and ever. Crown him, crown him, prophet and priest and king. Christ is coming over the world victorious. Power and glory unto the Lord belong. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. And then keep your songbooks out. Turn over to number 336. This is Isaiah 40, 31 in your Bible, but page 336 in your songbook. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Teach me, Lord, teach me, Lord, to wait. Sing that with me one more time. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Teach me, Lord, teach me, Lord, to wait. Thank you. You may be seated.
Good evening, church. It's wonderful to see you. I thought that probably as pastor, it might be a good idea if I showed up to church uh, now and then, but it's wonderful to see you here tonight. I apologize for my absence this last Sunday. Uh, I've told a couple of folks, if you were here two Sunday nights ago in the middle of a sermon, I just stopped talking and grabbed my chest and and it seemed like forever. I think it was probably only 30 seconds or a minute or so. Uh, my pain spiked uh, super, super high, and it just takes your breath away. Uh, I was in New York City uh, Friday uh, night and Saturday. I have a friend that pastors in the New York City area, and uh, he's been trying to get together with me. And so uh, I was at breakfast Saturday morning, and I got one of those spikes and it didn't let up at all, so we just uh, went back to Grand Central, got the first train home, and uh, it did, that spike lasted until 9 o'clock Sunday night. So it was well over 36 hours worth of that, um, and uh, so there's, there's kind of like no point to go to the hospital, because uh, I know what they're going to tell me, so we just sort of tried to ride it out. So I do apologize. Uh, I don't miss church uh, on a whim or lightly. I appreciate our young men. They did a phenomenal job uh, from what I could tell. And uh, so I'm, I'm certainly appreciative of that. Is there anybody who did not receive a prayer list as you came in tonight? Uh, if so, please raise your hand. Uh, you'll notice inside uh, there is uh, an updated campers list. Uh, next Monday, our teenagers and some adults are headed up to uh, New Hampshire uh, for New England Baptist Teen Camp. And uh, so we want to start praying for them. And I think this went out Sunday. Again, it's been a little bit updated. We've got some more campers that are going uh, at this point. And so I hope that you'll take some extra time and pray for them. A couple things to add to your list. Mark Held is in the emergency room as we speak. Uh, Lynn took him over uh, sometime this afternoon. He's struggling with some shortness of breath issues. Uh, so they're just uh, having everything checked out. And uh, that's about all we know at this point. So uh, put that on there. If you would pray for Brother Mark, uh, please. And Nick Bender, he's been on our list. He is there uh, under heart issues. Uh, Nick and Rebecca were supposed to move to uh, New Hampshire. Was it last week? And then it was going to be this week. He's back in the hospital again. And uh, so be praying for him. It looks like he's there till at least Friday of this week. Uh, so that, that trip to, or that move to New Hampshire just kind of keeps get, getting put off and put off. Uh, so certainly be praying the doctors can find out what to do to help him on a long-term basis. And, uh, but in the meantime, uh, please, uh, please be praying for him. Uh, Lindsay, I heard that your dad was undergoing some tests on Sunday. I didn't get any details. Any updates for us on that? He has lymphoma. I'm sorry to hear that. So please, what's his first name? Stuart. Stuart, and the last name is Temple. Stuart Temple. So if you'd please put him down. Uh, he has lymphoma, and uh, we'll keep him covered in prayer. And we'll get that on the list uh, on a permanent basis here. Is he in the hospital now, or is he home? Okay. Okay. We'll certainly be praying for him. If you'll take a moment uh, and please look at the prayer list. Uh, even though summer's out, we still have a lot of teachers. Uh, we pray for them. Kim Shorey serves here at Heritage Baptist Academy uh, as a teacher's aide, teaching art and yearbook. And boy, she's been a lifesaver many times over. We appreciate her. Uh, be praying for her. Government officials were praying for uh, Connecticut Attorney General William Tong. Uh, military praying for Brother Caleb Graf, uh, ser serving in the Army, stationed at Fort Campbell. Uh, pray for him. College student Sierra Simmons. We almost had Glassby on there. We're so used to saying that, but it's Sierra Simmons, uh, student at Middlesex Community College, and be praying for her. Uh, staff members were praying for Pastor Trelor and his family. Of course, they've got uh, new baby Trelor coming in just a few weeks, so be praying for them. A lot of adjustments coming their way. Does our youth music works in the school? Uh, this will be Brother Rob's first year not to be at camp. Uh, he's going to go up next Monday with them. I believe he's preaching Monday night. Uh, but Anna said, look, I don't mean to be bossy wife, but I am great with child, and I just don't like the idea of you being that far away in case Wesley decides to come early, and there's like no cell phone reception up there. They, they 
do smoke signals and things like that. Uh, so be praying for the Trelores, if you would. Our shut-ins are Andy and Norma tomorrow. And so please keep those folks in your prayers, if you would, please. As always, we direct your attention to the nations of the world. Uh, the Savior commanded go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So we pray country by country, uh, about 13 to 14 a week. And I hope you'll take the time and uh, pray for the people that live in these places. There may be missionaries there that we do not know of. There are several Arab nations on the list this week. Uh, and believe it or not, in some of these Arab countries, uh, there are some churches uh, and, and they're winning people to Christ. Many of them are underground. Uh, we support a missionary to the country of Egypt. Anybody know his name? Botros Faltos. Um, and he has started dozens and dozens of churches all across uh, the country of Egypt. And some of those churches are running thousands of people. It's hard to believe in a Muslim nation uh, that, that they are able to do that. So uh, just pray for these people if you would. And then on the back, we always do uh, list some of our... Uh, missionaries uh, with their, their prayers and their praises, so be praying for them. Uh, we have the Kenyangas on there. Martha Kenyanga has uh, colon cancer. They are back stateside for the time being while she's undergoing treatment, and as of this morning, she was going in for her second round of chemotherapy. Uh, so be praying for Martha and that family and their ministry back in Tanzania uh, as they're gone. Some of the finest people you'll ever meet. Uh, are the Kenyangas, so please, please keep them in your prayers. Uh, how many of you have something that you would appreciate being prayed for tonight? Does anybody like that? Just please glance around and uh, lift one another up in prayer. And that's what we're going to do for a few moments. Uh, tonight is the start of our summer kids club, so all of our staff guys, uh, several adults are down there helping out. Uh, be praying for them. But let's go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, you're welcome to pray at your seat or at the altar by yourself or invite someone to pray with you. We'll pray for a while and then I'll come to the pulpit and close our season of prayer.
Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you for all that you've done for us. Thank you for our church, for this family. Thank you for the blessings that we have seen happen in this place. Thank you for answers to prayer all around this room, our people, that they at one time were on this prayer list for severe issues, and Lord, you've seen them through, and you've healed and blessed and raised them up, and so we thank you for that. Lord, that encourages us as we pray tonight for others that are going through some trials. I think of Lindsay Mulberg's dad. Lord, what a kind and gracious man. He's visited here quite often. Lord, I pray that you would bless him as he goes through the treatments and uh, all of that for the lymphoma. Give his doctors wisdom. Uh, Lord, we pray for healing for him. Uh, whether it's by miracle or medicine, it's always you that does the healing. Would you be with his family? May they all know your comfort and your grace and your strength during this time of trial. And Lord, I pray for Mark Held as right now he's at the emergency room. Give the doctors that are looking after him great wisdom. Help them to find the cause of the problem. I pray that it's nothing serious. And uh, Lord, it'd be wonderful he, if he could be back home even tonight. Uh, but please bless him. Lord, we continue to pray for Nick Bender. Lord, this year has been very tough on him. He has spent, I'm going to guess, probably all told now, a, month, a couple of months in the hospital. Uh, if you add it all up and Lord, uh, encourage him, encourage he and Rebecca, Lord, provide for them in every way, financially, spiritually, emotionally, Lord, help the doctors to know best how to treat him, help him to respond to that treatment. And Lord, I know that they've uh, planned to move to New Hampshire. They've believed that that was your will for them. Uh, that's been delayed a bit. Lord, give them the grace and the patience to be able to wait that out, but please help them. Lord, for all of the needs that are represented by the dear folks in this room tonight, would you undertake in each life and in each situation, and please bless and draw every one of us uh, closer to you than we've uh, ever been before. Lord, thank you that our teenagers once again have the opportunity to go to camp, and Lord, over the years, so many wonderful decisions have been made, life-changing ones, as they've gone to various camps around the country, and Lord, I pray that this year, you would even now prepare their hearts, not just to have a good time, but Lord, to, to meet with God. I pray that while they're there, they would just willingly let you speak to them. For every person that is going to preach behind the pulpit, Lord, fill them with the power of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, I pray that you would watch over our group as they travel, keep the vehicle safe on the highway. Uh, I pray that they would have safety through the week. From what I'm hearing, the weatherman is calling for some rain next week, and I pray that you might just part the clouds and allow them to just have a, a good week of weather and a good time together, help our kids to be a good testimony for their families, for their church, and of course, for their Savior. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to meet in the middle of the week to study the Bible. As we open our Bibles in a little bit, would you open our eyes that we might behold wondrous things out of thy law. For all that you do, we'll thank and we'll praise you for it. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, if you want to turn in your Bibles uh, to Ephesians chapter 6, and our ushers will come. We want to make ready to receive the offering tonight. As always, be faithful in your tithes and offerings. Please don't forget out on the bulletin board right out on the right side as you step in the hallway are the envelopes. There are still some up there left for teen camp. Uh, and if you are able to help out a little bit, uh, just grab an envelope and whatever number is on there, you put that amount of money in the envelope, put it in the offering plate or in the box outside the office, and that helps defray the cost. I, I think already with, uh, with what has come in through the envelopes and, and, and stuff so far, um, it, the ca cost of camp has gone from $300 a camper down to about $100. Uh, so that's, that's a lot. And so thank you for that. Again, if you can help out, there's still a few more days to do so. Uh, I hope that you'll plan to do that. And uh, Brother Joe, would you come pray for the offering tonight? Father, we do thank you and praise you for this night. We do thank you for our pastor, Lord, and that he's here tonight. We pray that you would take away any pain, discomfort that he may have and give him the words to speak to us tonight, Lord. I pray that you would bless this offering, bless the gift and giver. 
We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Man, thank you. A couple of quick announcements as they're receiving the offering. Ladies, we need some help from you for the summertime. Uh, obviously, in the summer, there's a lot of folks on vacation and in and out of town a lot. And uh, we've got some needs within our nursery Partly because of that, uh, we got a couple ladies that help out in the nursery that are going to be having babies themselves this summer, and so they're going to be out a little bit. Uh, Carrie Urbanowitz, who is one of our nursery directors, she's actually having some major surgery uh, in just a few weeks, and so she's going to be out for a while. So we just need some ladies who can volunteer for the summer to just step in if, if you just help out one service, one Sunday. And I know some of you, you, you spent years helping out in the nursery uh, and all of that, and, and uh, we certainly appreciate that. If you could just step back in for a service or two, uh, that would uh, help an awful lot. Uh, if you are... Um, uh, one of those that Tommy refers to as old, uh, he likes walking. He thinks he's fascinated right now with gray hair. So if he walks up and asks you if, if you're old, he's not trying to be rude. He's, he's just trying to process uh, that thing. Uh, but maybe you can just come and sit in one of the rocking chairs and just hold a baby in your arms. Uh, and the, the other worker can uh, play with the kids or change diapers or whatever. Ladies, if you could help with that. Uh, again, we're not asking for anything long-term. We're not asking you, for, you to commit for the next 35 years to working in the nursery. Just help see us through the summer months. If you'll see Mrs. Urbanowicz, she's right over here tonight. Uh, I'm sure she would be very happy to talk to you, uh, and that would be a great blessing indeed. Uh, parents of academy students, final report cards will be available outside the church office after the service tonight and again this Sunday. If you've not yet gotten yours, uh, please uh, stop by and get it tonight. This coming Friday, the teens have an activity. It is video game night, 6.30 to 9.30. The cost is $2 per person. And I think that's all the announcements. Oh, we got... Uh, the Save New England magazines are out on the Lord's Supper table in the uh, lobby. These are free. Uh, they come out uh, once a quarter. Very good articles in here. Pastor Paul Chapman uh, puts this out. Uh, so please go ahead and take one of those. If you go out there and they're all gone, please take the one that's here on the pulpit. Uh, and uh, we, we, I hope you'll do that. And uh, it'll be a blessing to you. Are you in Ephesians 6 yet? Okay. Um, the church at Ephesus is one of the most mentioned churches in the New Testament. Obviously, we read in Acts 19, as we studied that whole chapter, as Paul went to the city, established the church, he spent a great deal of time there, longer than any other church that he planted in the city of Ephesus. He will go back in Acts 20. We, we will get back to that and uh, meet with the elders of the church of Ephesus. And, he, and, and they'll be talked about one more time in Acts 20. But beyond that, we find that Paul mentioned that same church in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He mentioned it in 2 Timothy chapter number 4. Of course, the book of Ephesians was written to the church at Ephesus. And the apostle John uh, was, was dic uh, uh, dictated a letter by the Lord Jesus himself to the church at Ephesus in Revelation chapter number 2. So it is a church that has a, a great history. It was one of the greatest soul-winning churches of the New Testament. It was also the place where Paul endured some of his greatest spiritual battles. In 1 Corinthians 15, 32, if you remember, Paul stated that he had fought with beasts at Ephesus. We know that he wasn't thrown in with wild animals. Undoubtedly, he's referring to individuals like Jude referred to as brute beast. 2 Timothy 4, Paul wrote that a man named Alexander the coppersmith in Ephesus had done him much evil. We know from Acts 19 that Paul dealt with many unclean spirits or demonic possessions in that city. Also in Acts 19, we found out that many of Paul's converts in that city came out of the dark arts or uh, the occult type background. And they gathered all their books, 
their paraphernalia together, and when they counted the cost, 50,000 pieces of silver, about a million dollars in today's currency, uh, that's a lot of stuff. And they burned them and destroyed them. So there was a, a, a deep darkness over that city. As uh, weeks ago, as I was working through my studies for this, uh, and I, I realized how much Ephesus was mentioned in the writings of Paul in the New Testament, and almost every time there was some type of spiritual warfare or battle involved, my mind was drawn to the, the armor of God in Ephesians chapter 6, starting in verse 10, down through verse number 18. We're not going to go back through every part of it again or every aspect uh, of, of this passage. We've done so a number of times. But I will remind you that Paul said twice, first in verse 11, put on the whole armor of God, not a piece here and there, but the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Verse 13, Paul also said, wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God. There's that emphasis. Don't leave any part off. Don't think that you can ignore that part from your life and be safe from the wiles of the devil. He said, take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Thus far, we have started in verse 13. We've talked about where he says on verse 14, stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth. That belt, that leather belt that protected the core, the vital organs there. Uh, we talked about truth being absorbed down into the innermost part of our being. Not having just a superficial knowledge of the things of God or of the Bible, but really letting it sink on the inside. We talked about the breastplate of righteousness, truth being applied. Jesus said in John chapter 13, verse 17, if ye know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. James taught us, be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. You can quote the Bible all day long, but if you don't apply and do what you're quoting, it's of no real practical value, that breastplate of righteousness. We talk thirdly about having our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. That is truth proclaimed. Uh, we, we studied that we need to be careful where we go. We need to be careful who we go with. But above all, where we go as we're following the leadership of God, we're to take the gospel everywhere that we go. Yesterday, I was uh, down at a barber shop on Route 5 that, that uh, I, I usually go to about once a month or so. And uh, they have about a dozen or so barber chairs in there. It's a very long type building. And, and I was in a chair. My barber uh, spoke very limited English. So there wasn't a whole lot of conversation because I have very limited Spanish. I said, buenos dias. And that was my limit. Uh, so it was kind of quiet where we were. And he was just cutting my hair. But about a halfway down uh, the row of barber chairs, there was a conversation going on. There was one barber. He was cutting some, another man's hair, and in the chair next to him was a guy getting his hair cut. And the guy that was cutting hair, the barber, um, he was talking about Jesus, talking about the Lord, and I thought, well, maybe he's trying to witness uh, to this person or whatever. And the more I listened, I found out this guy uh, was as lost as a one-eyed blind duck in a hailstorm at night. He was talking about Jesus and how he believed in Jesus, but he does his seven chakras, whatever that's all about. Um, and you know that uh, there's many ways to heaven and so forth. And, and, and he's kind of loud about it. He's not shy about it. But the guy in the chair, uh, he came in to get a haircut. He is quoting Bible the whole time to this guy. He's being very kind about it, but he's not being any more quiet than the barber is. And with every, every false thing that this guy was putting out, he had a good Bible answer to give to him. And he was bold. He wasn't ashamed of it at all. Um, I was hoping to get a chance to chat with him, but he left before I did. Uh, but I was just sitting there going, amen, brother. And I was praying for him uh, because everybody in that barber shop was hearing the gospel 
uh, because of this conversation. We ought to be that ready in any circumstance to share our faith. Uh, the Bible says that we're to sanctify or set apart the Lord God in our hearts and be ready always to give an answer to any man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you. Um, and that gentleman, I have no idea who he was, didn't get to meet him. He was, he was ready and he was doing it. Your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Last Wednesday night, we talked about the shield of faith. Again, in verse 16, first two words are, above all. He's not telling us that the other parts of the armor of God are unimportant because we've already learned twice it says put on the whole armor of God. So everything we had studied up to that point is vital to us, and, but as important as they are, Paul says above all, make sure you've got the shield of faith. Uh, the shield was a defensive weapon that the, sh the soldier carried uh, a, a Roman soldier, as we said, spent almost as much time learning how to use his shield as he did his sword. It was that vital to his safety and success in battle. Uh, the, the matter of faith. We looked at James and learned that there are three types of faith. There was devilish faith. You believe that there's one God, ye do well. The devils believe also and tremble. This is sort of a generic type faith. Uh, oh yeah, I believe, I, believe the, I believe the Bible's the word of God and that's, that's fine, so does the devil. Uh, that type of thing, that's a devilish faith. There's a dead faith where we now know some specifics. We, we know how to be saved or we, we know how we're supposed to live. We know how we're supposed to treat people, how we're supposed to talk. We know that we're supposed to go to church or share our faith and on and on it goes. We just don't do it. That is a dead faith. It produces nothing. It is a useless faith, if you will. And then there's that dynamic faith where we hear the word of God preached or we read the Bible and we learn the truth of God's word and we put that into practice and, and we become a Hebrews chapter 11 individual. And that dynamic faith it is what produces the results, and that is the faith uh, wherewith ye shall quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. We looked last week in the closing moments of the Bible study at 2 Samuel chapter 11. Uh, we read just that first verse of the chapter where the Bible talks about uh, when the, the year was expired, the time came when kings go forth to battle but David tarried still in Jerusalem. We ask ourselves some questions. Did David know he was supposed to go to battle? And the answer was yes. But he did not go, did he? That was dead faith. Um, he knew what he was supposed to be doing. That is leading his army in battle. But he wasn't doing it. That was dead faith. He knew it was wrong to be observing Bathsheba as she bathed herself, but he did it anyhow. Dead faith. He knew it was wrong for him to have an affair with a married woman, but he did it anyhow. Dead faith. In all of those situations, if even one time David would have exercised dynamic faith, the rest of David's story would have been amazingly different. Um, dynamic faith protects us from all the fiery darts of the wicked. Tonight, I want us to go now to verse number 17. Verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, the helmet of salvation. The Roman soldier wore a helmet that was made of some type of metal, most often brass, the helmet was many times lined with that same thick leather that the, the, the girdle about their waist was, was made with or their shield was back with. Uh, sometimes they would put a, a layer of sheep's wool inside there to make it a little more comfortable so it didn't chafe and so forth. The helmet was important because a blow to the head could be most of the time fatal or it could eliminate you. It, it might be a crippling blow, that type of thing. So the protection of the head was vitally important. 
What do you suppose the helmet is supposed to protect for the believer? The mind. We're going to talk about that tonight. Um, by the way, when I decided I was going to go through the armor of God, it was going to be one Bible study. We were just kind of going to walk through it, make some comments. And uh, the Holy Spirit said, no, that's just not the way to cover this one. Uh, the helmet of salvation, um, I'm just going to tell you right now, it's not going to be one Bible study. It's going to be two. Uh, I'm not trying to drag my feet or belabor, belabor anything, but this is important stuff. This is important stuff. We're in a battle, folks. We are in a battle such as some of us never ever dreamed would happen in the country in which we live or the culture in which we live. The helmet of salvation. The Bible mentions our minds or our thoughts in 239 verses throughout the Old and the New Testament. God talks about it an awful lot. Now, we're going to use our Bibles a good bit tonight, so get ready. Turn, if you would, to Isaiah chapter 26. Isaiah 26. I'm going to try to keep them in order so we're not bouncing back too much. Isaiah chapter 26. One of my favorite verses, it's actually a scripture song. Maybe someday I'll teach it to you. Um, Isaiah 26, verse 3. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. Isn't that a great verse? I have it highlighted in my Bible. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace. That means flawless or unending peace. How many, how many could use a dose of that in life? Perfect peace. Here's where it comes from. Whose mind, that's your thought life is stayed on thee. The word stayed means fastened upon. Uh, it means focused on. It's like laser-like focus on the Lord himself. Remember when uh, uh, Jesus came walking out on the Sea of Galilee during a storm, the disciples were in the boat, and Peter said, Lord, if it's really you, bid me come to you on the water. And Jesus said, come. Peter stepped out on the water, and he started walking towards Jesus, what happened to Peter on the way to where Jesus was? He started to sink. Why? Yeah, the Bible says when he saw the winds and the waves boisterous, he got his eyes off of Jesus. He started looking around thinking, what on earth am I doing? Look at the size of those waves and the wind is howling. And he got his eyes off of Christ and he began to sink. And then all, he realized his mistake. Lord, save me. He's now back there again. And the Lord took his hand. And by the way, we can mock Peter, but how many times does a storm mess us up? And you remember... Peter's the only human being, Jesus was God who became man. Peter's the only human being that walked on water that wasn't frozen. Okay? But he walked back to the book. He got his eyes off the Lord. So we have this promise. We'll have this thing called perfect peace, but our mind has to be focused on him. A lot of things vying for our thoughts. Um... I can only listen to a little bit of the news. I don't know about you. Um, I can listen to about 30 seconds of Sean Hannity and I've had enough for a week. Um, and talk radio and all that kind of stuff. It, it's all gloom and doom. It's all disaster. It's all, it, it's all you know, geared to getting us stirred up. You're not going to have a lot of peace if that's controlling your thought life. Am I right? You're not going to have perfect peace if your mind is embroiled in hateful thinking, uh, malicious thinking, envious thinking, immoral thinking, all the things that are contrary to the Lord. But if my mind is focused on God, it doesn't matter what's going on out there. I can still have this peace that passeth understanding. And it depends on my thought life. That's what Isaiah 26, 3 says. Turn, if you would, please, Matthew 22. Matthew 22. This is where Jesus is being asked, what is the great commandment? The first, the great commandment. In verse 37, Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God 
with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. Isn't that an amazing statement? Love the Lord your God with all your mind. Consider the thousands of thoughts that go through our minds a day. Do our thoughts demonstrate that we love God? When we wake up in the morning and we realize God's given us a new day and we say thank you, does that show love for the Lord? Yeah. Um, when we read the Bible and find a great promise and we thank him for that, does that show love for the Lord? Yes. When, when we're filled with gratitude and praise over answer to prayer or over just a beautiful day or, or over some blessing and th that came along and we say, thank you, Lord, does that show love for the Lord? Yes or no? See, I'm supposed to love God with not part of my mind, which means not just sometimes, but with all of my mind, okay? So I'm sitting at the red light and the idiot in front of me lets the light turn green and doesn't know that it's green until it turns yellow and they get through, but I don't. And I'm calling them an idiot. Am I showing my love for God? Yeah, no, not at all. It's, it's, not, being, it's not being very Christ-like. Um, when my mind is consumed and how angry I am at somebody else, is that, is that loving God with all my mind? No. Do, do you see that love for God is more than just an emotion that we have? It's more than just words that we speak? The Bible says it's, it's also got to be a part of my thought life. It's demonstrated. It, it's rooted there. I'm to love him with all my mind. Luke chapter 12. And, and I'm, I've got a lot of scriptures, and, and I had to sort of pick and choose because there are 239 of them, and I chose not to go through all of them tonight. Look at Luke chapter um, 12, verse number 29. The Savior says, and he's talking to his disciples, we know that from verse 22, he said, and seek not ye what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, neither be ye of what? Doubtful mind. This is a companion passage to Matthew 6, 33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. He's talking to them about following him in faith, trusting that God is gonna provide and I believe where God guides, God provides. That's our God. He tells them, be not of a doubtful mind. See, our mind can get us to start second-guessing God or second-guessing that spiritual decision that we made uh, and so forth. He says, don't be of a doubtful mind. Acts 17. Acts 17. I should probably pick up the pace. Acts 17. This is where Paul is in the city. Paul and Silas are in the city of Berea. They just had to leave Thessalonica because of death threats there. Uh, they came to the synagogue of the Jews. Verse 11, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all, next three words, church, readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Have you ever heard of the phrase closed-minded? How many of you have ever heard that? There's sometimes people just shut their, 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 their mind off, said, I don't, I don't care what you say. Uh, I already know what I believe and, and uh, don't confuse me with the facts. I'm not changing my mind. And, and you might as well just talk to the wind. You're not going to convince them. Paul ran into that a lot as he went into the synagogues. We've seen that in our walk through the book of Acts. But at Berea, he found some folks that listened to him with all readiness of mind. They had a mindset that said, if this is the word of God, we want to know what it says. They were like, if you will, hungry little baby birds in the nest with their mouths wide open, just waiting for mama bird to put the food in there. They were ready for it with readiness of mind. Acts 20. Acts 20. 
We will be someday studying Acts 20 when I'm done with the armor of God. We're getting close. Look at verse number 19. Paul is testifying to the elders of Ephesus, reminding them of his time with them, his ministry. He said, serving the Lord with all, next three words, church, humility of mind with many tears and temptations which befell me by the lying of weight of the Jews. All humility of mind, a mindset, a way of thinking that says, I am not better than you. I am not your Lord and master. Uh, I am not the answer to everyone's prayers. You're not lucky to have me. He said, with humility of mind. In other words, I'm just lucky to be here. I'm happy to be here. And Paul had that mindset. Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. We're we'll started verse. Uh, let me see. Verse 21. Uh, verse 21. Because that when they knew God, Paul is rehearsing the history of mankind. When they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their what? imaginations, imaginations when we sit and we, we think up our own story, became vain or empty in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. So they got this amazing God and, and, and they change that glory and say, we're going to worship a camel or a cat or a crocodile or a hippo or, or something like that. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever, amen. For this cause, God gave them up into vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly, receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a what? Reprobate, a worthless mind to do those things which are not convenient. Notice it started with vain imaginations in verse 21. Verse 28, they decided they didn't want to retain God in their knowledge. They just wanted to, to kick God out of their thought process and, and so forth. So God let them have a reprobate mind. By the way, what sin is being described in this passage? Homosexuality. Um, does that not describe much of what's going on in our culture today? Uh, every time you hear somebody stand up and say, here are all the verses about what Jesus said about homosexuality, and they have a blank page, take them to Romans chapter 1. So, well, Paul wrote that. Uh, no, the Holy Spirit of God wrote that. And uh, you understand the Holy Spirit and Jesus and God the Father are one. Um, the mind, a vain imagination, not retaining God in their knowledge. Now there's a reprobate mind. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, the Bible says so much about our thought lives. Verse 7, because the carnal mind, that's a fleshly mind, that's a fleshly governed mind. Remember the church at Corinth, Paul said, I can't speak to you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal. The carnal mind is enmity against God. Does anybody know what the word enmity means? It means warfare. The carnal mind is enmity against God. So if my mind is, is involved and engaged 
is governed by carnal fleshly thoughts. If it feels good, do it. Well, I don't see anything wrong with. I know the Bible says, but do you understand that mind, the carnal mind is at war with God. Those are some pretty bold terms that God uses there. Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Verse 2 is the theme of our summer kids club. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the what? Renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I did not grow up in a Christian home. We didn't have the Bible governing us. Uh, I wasn't in a Bible-believing church or anything like that. So we were a household that was your typical lost family. Uh, we didn't do drugs or run the streets. There weren't any streets because I lived out in the country in the middle of nowhere. Uh, we ran the dirt roads, uh, was about it, uh, and so forth. But when I got saved, I had the mindset, the mind of the average 14-year-old unsaved boy. Uh, the music that I listened to was wrong in, in all kinds of ways. And it was, the, it was the music of the 60s and 70s. It's stuff they play in elevators now uh, and, and things like that. Uh, but it was filled with, with uh, references to immorality and Satanism and stuff like that uh, and so forth. Um, I watch television shows like Rowan and Martin's Laugh-In. Some of us are old enough to remember that. That at the time seemed so funny, but years and years later after I got saved, I, I, I watched an old rerun and I could stand about two minutes of it and had to shut it off. It was so absolutely vile, but my unsaved mind, that didn't register at all. So here now I got saved and I've got a mind that doesn't see anything wrong with rock music and doesn't see anything wrong with these television programs. Didn't see anything wrong with women that weren't dressed uh, appropriately. Didn't see anything wrong with off-color jokes or dirty jokes because that's just what we did as unsaved kids. Well, now I'm saved and the Bible says here, I'm not supposed to be conformed to the word. I'm not supposed to be like them, but I'm to be transformed by the renewing of my mind. I, I had to change the way I thought about things. We're, we're going to find out where that renewing comes from and the basis for that. Um, but my mind had to change. And it, it's not about this person's opinion versus that person's opinion. Uh, I'm going to reveal what's coming soon. It's what does the Bible say? The Bible comes, becomes a foundation that governs our mind. Uh, look at Romans 12, verse 16. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Here there's this idea of humility of mind once again. Um, the same mind. We're supposed, to, we're supposed to think alike as believers. But I like the middle of verse 16. Mind not high things. Don't have your focus on, on uh, 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 things of importance. I want to be important, and I want to be popular, and, and I want, or I want to be famous, or I want. Don't don't be like that. Uh, don't be like, well, I'm better than so and so, or I'm smarter than so and so, or I, I can do this better. Um, the Bible says, condescend to men of lower state. Just put yourself down there. Just, just just be down there with everybody. Don't think anybody's better than you are, or that you're better than anybody else. It's a mindset. Um, 2 Corinthians 8, and I am really trying to hurry. I told you I'm not reading all 239, but I'm reading a few of them, aren't I? 2 Corinthians chapter 8, Paul's talking about the matter of giving. He says in verse number 12, for if there be first a willing mind, it is accepted according to that a man hath, and not according to that he hath not. One of the most amazing truths of the Bible is God's not trying to force you and I to do anything. He's never done that. Back in the Old Testament, when they were going to build the tabernacle, they said, God told Moses, we're going to need gold and silver. 
We're going to need diamonds and rubies and emeralds and sapphires. Uh, we're going to need acacia wood. Uh, we're going to need some uh, very fine twined linen. We're going to need all these kind of things. He says, so just put the word out there that if anybody is willing hearted, any, anybody's willing, bring in an offering. They didn't go out door to door and saying, hey, you, we, we know you've got some gold, turn it over. It's if you're willing. And when it came for the work itself, anybody that's willing. When David was building the temple or getting things for the temple and then Solomon was building, the same principle held too. Nobody was forced to do anything because God's not trying to force us to do anything. It's with a willing mind. Same thing goes with our giving. A willing mind is what God is looking for. That's the mind that gets blessed by the Lord. Turn, if you would, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 1. For it's touching the ministering to the saints. They were taking an offering for the saints in Jerusalem. It is superfluous for me to write to you, for I know the forwardness of your mind, for which I boast of you to them of Macedonia, that Achaia was ready a year ago, and your zeal have provoked very many. The forwardness of your mind. Uh, they, they just, they, again, it's this willing mindset, but in this case, it's even a little bit more than that. Um, they're not just willing to do something. They are chomping at the bit to do something. It is the idea that it gets there. It, it's the mindset that they have. Turn to, I'm just gonna uh, move a little faster. Ephesians 4, Ephesians chapter 4. Verse 17, this I say therefore and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their what? Mind. Um, how many here were not raised in a Christian home? You, you got saved a little bit later in life like I was, okay? Um, before we got saved, we walked in the vanity of our mind. We just, we just did what everybody else around us did. It wasn't even necessarily that we were trying to do bad or be bad. We, we just didn't see anything wrong with what we were doing, how we are living. I'm going to understand that. Paul says now, now that you're saved, don't walk like the unsaved Gentiles do, like you used to, in the vanity of their mind, the emptiness of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. I mean, they're just out there doing as much wrong as they can, but you've not so learned Christ. If so be that you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Christ Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation, that's your old lifestyle, the old man, which is corrupt according to deceitful lust and be renewed in the spirit of your Mind. That's at Romans 12, 2, being renewed in our minds again. Uh, I could go on and on, but I, I, I think you get the idea. The Bible has just an awful lot to say about our mind. Now, listen carefully as we consider that, that God's word talks so much about it. Perfect peace comes when my mind is stayed on him. I'm not just supposed to love him with my heart. I'm to love him with all of my mind. With that said, if you study through the Bible and you consider even in your own life, Satan's first attacks almost always come through our mind. It almost always starts here. Dr. Bob Jones Sr. said that every tragedy of human character is the result of a long process of wicked thinking. Did you get that? Every tragedy of human character is the result of a long process of wicked thinking. Go back to 2 Corinthians, this time chapter 4. Second Corinthians chapter 4, in verse number 3. The Bible says, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God, little g, of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, 
should shine unto them. How many of you think that the gospel message is like the greatest thing that you ever heard? Anybody besides me like that? Um, the minute I heard it, I didn't get saved right away. But the minute I heard it, I knew it was true. Um, the only reason I didn't get saved is I didn't understand an invitation and what that was all about. Uh, it was my first time in that type of an environment. But, but it resonated with me and so forth. And after I got saved, it was, it was the answer to the worries of a little boy that had gone on for a lot of years up through my teenage years uh, and so forth. I thought it was the most wonderful news in the world. I just, I thought everybody would want to know about this. I got saved two weeks before I started my sophomore year of high school. I've been saved two weeks. And uh, I, I went to my, it was a brand new high school for me. There were 2,500 students there. There were 1,008 students in my sophomore class that started that. And I hit the ground running. I didn't know my Bible very well. I just knew that I was saved. I, I knew what gospel tracts were a little bit. And man, I'm just passing out tracts to everybody and, and, and so forth. I remember asking my youth pastor's wife, is there something you can give me that'll teach me how to tell somebody how to get saved? And, and, and she gave me something uh, that the, the church had and, and, and I memorized all the verses and, and all that kind of stuff. And I just, I just set out, I just thought everybody in my school would want to get saved because it was the most awesome thing in the world. Guess how many got saved my sophomore year? None. And I witnessed to probably a couple hundred. Guess how many got saved my junior year? One. Um, you say, why? Because you see, the God of this world's blinded the minds of them that believe not. That's why when you talk to somebody, if you died today, do you know for sure you go to heaven? No, I don't. Can I show you from the Bible? No, I'm not interested. Or no, I've got my own way. Or no, I've got my own religion, but you don't know you're going to go to heaven. And the Bible says you can know that for sure. No, I'm not interested. Why? Why is that wall up there? The God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not. There's so many philosophies out there, so many false religions and, and things like that out there. Um, look at the way that our media tries to poison the minds of everyone against Bible Christianity. Um, if, you, if you listen to CNN or MSNBC or any of the rest of that ilk uh, out there, um, we're the most hateful people in the world. Are, are we burning down any cities? Independent Fundamental Baptists, are we doing that? Are we flipping over police cars, setting them on fire? No, we're not. Do who, who's doing that? They are. But, but we're the ones that are filled with hate because we take a Bible stand. And I realize there are some people taking Bible stands and they're not being real smart about it. But you can be as gracious as you can and just say the Bible says and all of, all of a sudden you're a hate monger and all that kind of stuff. Why is that going on? The God of this world hath blinded the minds of them that believe not. He doesn't want them to know the truth of the gospel. The, the devil's attacks come through the mind. In Genesis chapter 3, and we're running out of time, but we don't even have to turn there. The serpent in the Garden of Eden. Um, he, he immediately starts asking questions. Yea, hath God said. He's trying to get Eve to think. He starts out, yea, hath God said, ye shall eat of every tree of the garden. And God did say that. But, he, but the end of the sentence was except for the tree of knowledge of good and evil. He said, yea, hath God said, ye shall eat of every tree of the garden. Didn't God tell you that you could eat of every tree of the garden? And Eve wisely and correctly answered, we can eat of every tree except the tree of knowledge of good and evil. For the Lord said in the day that ye eat thereof, ye shall surely die. And she answered, well. And then the devil comes along and said, ye shall not surely die. He lies now. He's getting her to think these things through. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, your eyes shall be opened and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. In other words, you'll be on the same level of God and you can decide for yourself whether something is good or bad. Today we call that your truth 
or my truth. No, there's just truth. There's just truth, okay? But, but Satan's got Eve thinking about all of this. And the Bible says that she saw the tree, that it was good for food, it was pleasant to, be, to, to the eyes, tree to be desired to make one wise. What's going on? Her thought processes are there. She's not hungry. If she was, she could have eaten anything she wanted. Um, there, there's nothing like that going on. He is, he is getting her to de, 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 deny and disobey God himself. And he did it through her mind, getting her to think. And the Bible says in the New Testament that she was deceived in the transgression. The devil's attacks almost always start up here. Well, I know the Bible says, but do you really think? Do you really think that's true? It all starts up here in our mind. There's a third thing we need to understand about this. Our, our thought lives are, are, are key to so much. The peace of God, our love for God, uh, all of those things. Satan's going to attack through the mind. Turn to John chapter 8. And we may end up stopping here. John chapter 8. Here's the third point on this one. Satan is a liar. He's going to attack through our thought lives. He's going to convince us that God's way is not the best way. That if you live for God, you're going to miss out on all the fun of like prison, addiction, all those things. You're going to miss out on all the fun. Um, you won't be cool. You, you won't be included. Um, you'll, you'll live a miserable life. The truth of the matter is, there's nobody that's lived for God that's looked back and regretted it, but there are multiple millions of people that have ignored God and looked back and regretted and said, boy, I wish I, I, wish I would have lived for God. Look what it says in John chapter 8, verse 44. Ye, he's talking to the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and so forth. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own for he is a what? A liar and the father of it. Say it with me. The devil is a liar. The devil, say it again. The devil is a liar. The devil is a liar. He's going to tell you that this book's not true. He's a liar. He's going to tell you that you won't be popular if you live for God. The devil's a liar. Popularity's not what it's all about anyhow. You won't be happy if you live for God. The devil is a liar. Um, we need to understand that, and he's the father of it. By the way, do you realize when we lie, who are we behaving like? Who? Satan. Is that, is that who you want to look like? Uh, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Diametrically opposed. Satan is a liar. So Satan's going to attack my mind. He's going to attack your mind. And I have to remind myself when that attack comes, and it will, that's why the helmet of salvation is so necessary, when that attack comes, I got to remind myself and know the truth. Wait a minute, the devil is a liar. He's not sometimes a liar. He's always a liar. He's the father of it. That's what he is. That's what he does. We're going we're gonna to finish this part of this up. <laughs> we're going to try to finish this up next, Sunday, or next Wednesday night. Um, I do want you to turn to one more scripture. It's 811. And we're going to dwell on this scripture a little bit as we come to a uh, conclusion next week about the, the helmet of salvation. Turn, if you would, to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Who controls your thought life? Anybody? Who controls 
your thought life? Do I control your thought life? Do your parents control your thought life? Do your friends control your thought life? Who controls your thought life? You do. You do. And I control mine. If I could control your thought life, I would. I would just love the power. I'd just have you all empty out your wallets, put all your money up on the... I wouldn't do that. Boy, if I could control my kids and grandkids' thought lives, man, they'd, they'd all be saved. They'd all love God with all their heart, soul, and mind, uh, and all of that. But that's just not the way it works. We control our own. Notice what Paul says in verse number three. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, fleshly, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. When my thought life is going in an area that is against the knowledge of God, against this book, I'm to cast it down. I'm to cast it down. Doubtful thoughts, hateful thoughts, lustful thoughts, jealous thoughts, all types of, any, any imagination, any, any high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, I'm to cast it down. And look on again in verse four. Um, I'm sorry, verse number five. And bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. That means I'm supposed to govern my thought life diligently. Every thought. Um, there'll be times I'll, I'll catch myself not quite daydreaming or, or whatever, but sometimes getting, letting myself get discouraged about things and sort of thinking like everything's negative. What's the point? Why should I? That's the moment I realize my thought life is careening out of control and I need to cast those down and I need to get my bring into captivity those thoughts to the obedience of Christ. Nope, God's still on the throne. I don't like what's going on in our, uh, in our country any more than you do, but God's still on the throne. And God's still good. And judgment day's coming. Y you do understand that. Um, and uh, maybe the person I just witnessed to didn't want to get saved, but that's okay. I was supposed to witness to him anyhow, a gospel to every creature. I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to bring every thought into captivity, I am. And so are you. Because if you don't, the devil's going to come in and attack you through your thought life, and you're going to fall. The helmet of salvation. We need to stop there. Father, thank you for the Bible. We've looked at dozens of verses tonight. We're not trying to be tedious. It's just your word has so much to say about our minds and our thoughts. Help us to learn to be wise and to govern our thought lives in a biblical manner. Would you dismiss us with your blessing tonight? Take us safely home. Help each of us to find somebody to witness to or give a tract to or invite to church between now and Sunday. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you are a father and you were not here Sunday, we have t-shirts in the back that were made as a Father's Day gift. Please, Brother Lacombe's going to be back there. Make sure that you go back and get your t-shirt and you are dismissed.